I was asked by a viewer to talk about statins and how they relate to LP little a or lipoprotein A. Let's take a look at that. Stay tuned. I got a comment from a Mr. Peter Townsend 252, and Mr. 252 suggested that I take a look at LP little a, more specifically the probable causal relationship between the level of LPA and arteriosclerosis cardiovascular disease risk. Because anytime we're talking about cardiovascular disease risk, we end up with a discussion about statins. Now this was a very information dense comment, and I feel it's almost a disservice to boil it down just to his opening statement here. And I may have to actually do more videos on some of the other issues that he raised in his comment. So in this case, I'm not going to go through a technical description of LP little a. There's plenty of good videos on the topic. Just go to YouTube and type in the search bar LP little a. And a lot of scientists and medical professionals who are much more capable to explain the ins and outs of LP little a will give you a good overview of it. For now, I'm just going to give it in brief terms. Briefly, it's related to LDLC. It's generally included in the LDLC value, though you can get a separate test to measure it directly. It's found in many primates and of all things in hedgehogs. And I saw this so many times that I was convinced that it must be a urban legend. But when I looked into it, there are plenty of scientific papers on LP little a being in hedgehogs and primates and no other mammals, which baffles me because that means somebody actually went out and measured the LP little a values in a whole bunch of mammals, couldn't find any anywhere except in hedgehogs. Independently, that means independent of LDL levels or trigs to HDL ratio or anything like that. It correlates with cardiovascular risk in humans. Now I haven't talked to any hedgehog doctors to find out if it corresponds to cardiovascular risk in hedgehogs. That's one of those mysteries of life we'll just have to live with. It's important to understand the measurement, specifically the units of measurement. Like LDL, HDL, triglycerides, and blood glucose, it may be measured as either a mass density or as a particle density. With all these types of particles, the conversion of one unit, mass density, to particle density will differ depending on the mass of the particles that we're talking about, as shown here. There are different conversion factors for LDL and HDL versus trigs versus blood glucose. Now, one of the things we really don't have to worry about is confusing the units, because if you tell me that your total cholesterol is 200, I know you must be talking milligrams per deciliter because 200 millimoles per liter makes no sense in the context of human physiology. Similarly, if you tell me that your cholesterol level is five or six or something like that, I know you're talking about millimoles per liter because a five or six milligrams for a deciliter doesn't indicate a living human being. So there's no confusion there. And similarly with trigs and blood glucose, there's just no real overlap in the number standing alone as it attaches to the just different units. That's not the case with LP little a. For one thing, there's no single conversion factor that we can apply because the LP little a particles vary in mass greatly. And another thing that they do is they don't measure in millimoles per liter, they measure in nanomoles per liter. A nanomole is one millionth of a millimole because a millimole is a thousandth of a mole, a micromole would be a millionth of it, and a nanomole is a billionth of it. Interestingly though, they still do measure on the mass side, they do measure in milligrams per deciliter. Unfortunately, there's a bit of an overlap in what the values will be in these different measurements. They're close enough that there is ambiguity. 50 milligrams per deciliter makes sense in the context of a human. 50 nanomoles per liter also makes sense in context of a human, but it is different. So if you tell me, well, my value is 50, we would have to know what the units were in order to make sense of that. So here's the conventional wisdom on LP little a. I agree with some of it, disagree with some of it. I'm just telling you what's out there. LPA correlates directly to cardiovascular event risk. So you see here values of over 125 nanomoles per liter is increased risk. Values over 50 milligrams per deciliter is increased risk. So you can see that if I tell you that my LP little a measure is 60, if that's milligrams per deciliter, then you're at increased risk. If it's at nanomoles per liter, well, you're not at an increased risk. Whenever I see values cut points like this, that's an arbitrary point on a continuum. It's not like at 124 nanomoles per liter, you're perfectly safe, and at 126, you're at increased risk. There's essentially no difference between those two measures, but these are the cutoff points that have been established. In my own case, I've actually had LP little a measured three times, and we'll see later why that's very unusual. In February 2020, when I first started being aware of this, I got a value back of seven. I was very excited that it was very low. In February of 2022, it had doubled. It had gone up to 
14. Now, that was around the time that I started a low carbohydrate, high fat diet. I really wasn't that concerned because while 14 is 100% higher than seven, they're both very low, so they're well below the levels of increased risk. And then in November 2023, I got a value that said, it's less than 10, we can't detect it. Well, that confused me greatly because I was from the Quest lab, and Quest is a pretty sophisticated lab in the United States. So if my regular doctor's lab could detect it at a level of seven, why couldn't Quest detect it if it was less than 10? And then I learned about the differences in units. Looking at the units, well, that February 2020 measure was in milligrams per deciliter. There isn't a single conversion factor, like I said, to go from one unit to the other. Seven milligrams per deciliter and 14 nanomoles per liter are in the same ballpark. So really nothing had changed. And then after a year and a half, maybe a little bit more on the high carb, low fat diet, my LP little a had actually dipped below detectable levels. So that may have been the impact. The fact is, it is a little bit variable despite what we're going to find out the conventional wisdom says. And the conventional wisdom, and I believe this is correct, for the most part, that LP little a is genetically determined. Along with that is the thought that diet, exercise, and statins do not affect blood plasma levels. And for example, on the CDC website, there's this statement. What can I do if I have high LPA? These levels cannot be controlled by healthy eating and exercising. Lipoprotein apheresis is the only therapy approved by the FDA for treating high levels. And they give this criteria for who would qualify somebody with familial hypercholesterolemia. I've done a video on that. With LDL levels over 100, that part is not uncommon. LP little a over 60 milligrams per deciliter, that's a little less common, but that indicates increased risk. Coronary or other artery disease. So it's not just the numbers, you'd actually have to have known disease. And like I had described in that video on familial hypercholesterolemia, apheresis is very much like kidney dialysis. Your blood is filtered through some machine and returned to you with the particles of concern being scrubbed out. But what do the studies say? Well, first of all, a low carb, high fat diet, especially high in saturated fat, actually reduces LP little a. And this has been known for over a third of a century. So I'm gonna to return to that statement in a little while from the CDC and take a little closer look at it. Now, the values from these studies do show it to being a 12 to 15% difference. That may not be therapeutically meaningful. However, as you can see from my values, I dropped from 14 to under 10. That's at least a 30% drop. These studies that say 12 to 15%, well, they only went on for a certain amount of time. Who knows how much the values could drop over more time. I thought that was interesting because for a lot of us, and that includes myself, a diet high in saturated fats actually increases LDL. So I thought, boy, it'd be really ironic if a treatment that reduces LDL also increases LP little a. And in fact, while the results are a little conflicting, they do indicate a trend towards increasing LP little a concentration when you are on statin therapy. In one of these papers, they describe the various ways that LP little a can be increased. Now it was genetically determined and it wasn't supposed to be affected by anything according to the CDC. But in fact, you can increase LP little a by reducing saturated fat in a diet having an underactive thyroid, menopause and growth hormones, kidney disease, or statin therapy. Now, out of those five things listed here, the dietary fat reduction and statin therapy are things that are under our control, but they will increase LP little a. Things that you might normally expect to have an impact on a lipid exercise or endogenous sex hormones, in other words, the ones generated by our body, they didn't seem to have any influence on LP little a. Finally, things that decrease LP little a, a low carb diet, high in saturated fat, overactive thyroid, hormone replacement therapy, and certain liver disease. The results were mixed for non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. But the point is, you can see that exactly what you expect. You reduce saturated fat, it makes LP little a go one way. You increase it, makes LPO go the other way. The interesting thing about it is that adding saturated fats to your diet, you're actually making the LP little a better. So let's return to that statement by the CDC. They said right here, LPA levels cannot be controlled by healthy eating. What's the term they use? Normally we say diet and exercise. So why are they saying healthy eating? Are they looking for plausible deniability here? They're not saying that it can't be affected by diet, but they don't want to admit that. They don't want to say that right out. They don't want to tell us that you can actually add saturated fat because from their point of view, that's a bad thing. But if you've been studying the cholesterol situations, especially if you're familiar with the lean mass hyperresponder phenotype, you're aware that maybe saturated fat is not necessarily bad for us the way that they're telling us that it is. 
I won't be getting into the lean mass hyper responder that's an LMHR in this video and I'll have a little bit to say about it at the end. While I was preparing for this video and getting ready to record it actually, a report ended up in my inbox. It was entitled LP little a is markedly more atherogenic than LDL. They did a genetic analysis on it. And you can read the statistics here on the screen. I'm not going to go through them, but I am going to look at the final statement here. And it says from these data, we estimate that the risk basically of LP little a is approximately six times greater than that of LDL on a per particle basis. LP little a is actually more important per particle on your cardiovascular risk than is LDL. Then they had this conclusion. Therefore, LP little a represents a key target for drug-based intervention. They were this close to getting that one right. My fear is that what's going to happen is if the pharmaceutical industry does come up with a drug that can reduce LP little a, they're going to double whammy people. They're going to put them on statins and put them on the LP little a so the two things can work against each other. And therefore that'll lead to polypharmacy and people will be on multiple drugs and you'll probably see some combos, you know, statin plus whatever that reduces LP little a and that'll be marketed to us at least in the United States with dancing ladies and people singing about, hey, my cholesterol is down and all that sort of stuff. So I'm just going to do a brief word on the genetics of LP little a. This is a very complex subject. I don't want to go into it too deeply here. But first, since conventional wisdom states that LP little a is genetically controlled, many doctors feel that you just take a single measurement in a lifetime and that's all that's necessary. Since it can't be impacted by diet and exercise, you got to deal with other risk factors such as smoking, type 2 diabetes, hypertension, and LDL levels. Well, smoking is easy enough conceptually to deal with. Just stop, even though I know that's hard. Type 2 diabetes, probably the best treatment that at least what worked for me, it was going on a lower carb diet. I'm not into the keto thing necessarily, but I was on a lower carb diet and higher fat. And, and of course, we have to acknowledge, like I've said in other videos, statins can increase your blood glucose levels. Hypertension, that's high blood pressure and LDL levels. And of course, the last item usually means going on statins. Also, there's a mutation at the LP little a no allele marker given here that results in a low LP little a and can be confirmed by way of 23andMe. Commercially, you can get this genetic test. I haven't done it yet. I do have, as I've indicated, very low LP little a. Haven't confirmed whether it's because of this. There is also another genetic mutation that is carried between 1 in 60 and 1 in 50 people. They are called R21X carriers, and it is known as a nonsense mutation. Now, that's not a pejorative term. So let's take a little look at that. A nonsense mutation, or its synonym, a stop mutation, is a change that causes a protein to terminate or end its translation earlier than expected. This is a common form of mutation in humans that causes a shortened or non-functional protein to be expressed. So if you're a carrier of this, you would have little to no LP little a in your blood. Now that actually worries me a little bit because it's got to have some positive function in human biology or it won't have evolved for us. So for a mutation to knock it out completely, I think that that's not necessarily something to be real excited about. Maybe it's something that in general we can live with and with our modern lifestyles and healthcare, maybe it's not going to be a problem, but it's just something to think about. Earlier in this video, I mentioned the lean mass hyperresponder phenotype. As I'm recording this, there's a whole lot of new information coming in all at once and it's kind of overwhelming. So I'm not really going to get deep into it here. I'll have to do another video on that, but I want to wait for the dust to settle on that. So if you are looking for the LMHR information, that'll have to come later. If you appreciate this content, and please like, share, subscribe, and comment on this topics or others that you'd like me to cover. And if you haven't seen this video, I recommend you take a look at it now. Thanks for listening.